Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at SEMI with Tom Salmon, who's going to talk about smart manufacturing and the impact of smart manufacturing on the microelectronics supply chain. Tom, what is smart manufacturing? So for SEMI, smart manufacturing, we're looking at a holistic view of the full microelectronics supply chain and how data is passed through the manufacturing uh, supply chain all the way from the material sets all the way through to, to the end product and how can we leverage uh, new technologies like the digital thread to take advantage of uh, better reliability, energy reduction, and other capabilities that will help, uh, help the supply chain. Okay, what have you drawn out for us here? So, um, I look at smart manufacturing in a couple of different stages. So many people might think that smart manufacturing is something new, it's uh, got a relative buzz to it, but in actuality, the semiconductor industry uh, has been working on some of these technologies, the base technologies, for quite some time. So what's changed there? Uh, some of these uh, technologies date all the way back on following the supply chain back to the days of EDI. Exactly. So going back into the uh, back to the 70s or early 80s, uh, the at the fab level between the equipment, uh, we've been building up both automation and information control capabilities. Probably the most uh, famous or the most well known, at least from a semi uh, standards perspective, are the sex gem standards that uh, started to come out in the in the 80s uh, that really focus on equipment to equipment communications and those have been continued to develop over time. What are some of these terms, MES, VC, HC, what do you, what's going on there? Here I have a rough schematic of how the information and control uh, happens in a fab here and this didn't happen all at once, it was developed over time. Initially we had, uh, we had mostly what we call one-way communication between the equipment. Uh, so I've got some representative equipment here. Um, further on that was developed into two-way communications which, which becomes very important later on in the smart manufacturing continuum. And this really, this is where the HC, this horizontal communication, this is horizontal communication between equipment and the fab here. More recently we have the vertical communication which is actually um, taking the horizontal communication that we have here between the equipment and passing that um, to the uh, manufacturing execution system here, the MES system for the, for the fab. Um, and now, um, so we have vertical, what we call vertical communications here. Uh, so they were passing this up to a higher enterprise level um, uh, within the fab. And that also becomes important later on when we start working into the digital thread. Where are we in terms of semiconductor manufacturing? The fabs seem to have gotten this first, right? They have the most to lose, they have the most uh, equipment, the, they had to refine the process better than anybody else in order to make Moore's Law work. Where's the rest of the supply chain? Right, so if we look at the semiconductor, particularly a leading edge semiconductor fab, the smart manufacturing capabilities or the capabilities with respect to information and control automation are probably ahead of any industry in the world, uh, the amount, both in the amount of data that we pull off of the um, equipment and then how we actually use that, that data. That is not the case as we move further on the supply chain. Uh, if we look at, we move from a typical front-end fab here to looking at the further supply chain. As I mentioned, we want to take a holistic view of the full microelectronic supply chain to really take advantage of the smart manufacturing capabilities. As I mentioned, the leading edge fabs are very far along in terms of information and control. And so I've drawn out a representative supply chain uh, here. We have materials, the equipment, the fabs, packaging and test facilities. Sometimes, of course, these are captive, but often not. Um, moving on to assembly and, and uh, EMS companies, and finally to the end product. The amount of data and data capture and data use is very high between the equipment and the fabs. Often this is a point-to-point -point solution, um, or often in many cases just within the fab. But if we go to say a packaging test or even further downstream into the assembly and EMS, uh, that 
the amount of data as well as the capabilities in terms of taking advantage of the information and control is, I would say, more at a medium level in the packaging and test and to a lower level within the assembly and EMS world. Is the big problem being able to get products out on time? Is it understanding where there are potential uh, problems within the supply chain, such as uh, contamination within the materials, for example? Or is it long-term reliability or all of the above? I think it's all of the above. When the semiconductor industry in particular was primarily focused on, uh, we had an IT focused industry basically from a product perspective. Now that we've shifted to more of a consumer product focus, the time to market pressures, uh, the product cycle pressures are such that the product companies all the way down through the supply chain need to get information in situ in the process quicker so that they can make adjustments, whether that's for a new design for a new product or to resolve any type of, as you mentioned, reliability issues or defect issues. The challenge really is to get that information, the right information from the right constituents at the right time to resolve those issues quickly. And you want that visibility to be all the way through the supply chain, which is your digital thread there, right? Exactly. So the promise, the big promise of smart manufacturing is to have this digital thread where data is essentially passed through the right data, again, the right data for the right people, um, because that's a very important point, obviously, is passed through the uh, supply chain so that we actually have protocols and pipelines to pass that data. Um, and can take advantage of that throughout the supply chain. So yes, we have this, we have the concept of the digital thread that we're working on in Smart Manufacturing Initiative. People have been saying that there's way too much data right now. How do we get through that and mine it and figure out exactly what we need? Yeah, so the, you're absolutely right. Uh, big data is a, obviously a buzzword. Uh, a lot of people talk about how can we get more data or the sensors, we have a, a lot of sensors on the equipment throughout the fabs. Within the semi-advisory council that's working on the smart manufacturing initiative, we our focus is on, yes, we, we want as much data as we can, but the, the focus is not so much on getting more data, the focus is on how do we ask the right questions and how do we use that data to achieve the objectives that we've, that we've laid out here with the digital thread and smart manufacturing. The way we're approaching it is looking at very specifically for each of these levels of data capture and capabilities, what, what specifically are the key bottlenecks with the data that we need? Is it uh, data on how the materials, uh, the material sets are reacting through the different processes? Is it certain reliability issues? Um, so we're digging deep into each of these areas. Uh, as an example, we have a, a, a group that's focused now on uh, both PCB manufacturer as well as PCB uh, assembly. And those, the issues that are coming up in the data sets there are different from the data sets that we're working on, say, between the equipment and fab. But the, the goal is to use similar protocols or be able to have those handshakes between the entities so that we can get to that digital thread pass through. So this has all worked out very nicely. Where do you see the problems coming in? So as we look at this digital thread, in the conversations, both within our advisory council as well as our broader special interest groups, each of these entities individually wants to take advantage of the capabilities. They want to be able to capture data and use it most efficiently. The main challenge comes in when you're actually starting to link these all together. If point-to-point -point solutions have been relatively successful, uh, particularly, say, between the equipment and the fabs, but when you start to link all of these together, the biggest challenge we really come across that comes up the most often in our discussions has to do with IP protection. So who gets to see what data at what point, right? And if I make this connection, how can I be assured that, you know, my, my competitor is not getting information along this, uh, this chain uh, and also through, well, throughout the, whole, throughout the whole supply chain? 
So are we making progress? One of the concerns for years has always been that nobody wants to share data because they think their competitors are going to look at it. Are people getting more comfortable with this? Yes and no. Uh, the, I, I think the, one of the reasons SEMI is involved in this and why I, I think it, it makes sense to have this at a holistic viewpoint, particularly coming from a trade association, is that we need, to, we need proofs of concept. We need to be able to show that in many of these systems, you can share the right data and also cover any IP uh, protection concerns. I don't know that people are quite comfortable with it yet because we haven't had those proof of concepts. However, there has been a lot of work in new uh, potential protocols that would allow us to do that. One example is uh, we've been it, within the SEMI initiative, we're now looking at uh, what are commonly recalled to as, as blockchain or per, uh, perhaps more correctly distributed ledger technologies uh, that would, similar to, many people are familiar with Bitcoin, uh, similar to that in the sense that it, it allows each entity to see the information and the data that's available to it and only that data. You set this up for the consumer type of, of supply chain. Does this work as well for all the other markets that are coming up, automotive, for example, or uh, some of the uh, cloud server type of applications, which are much more complex than some of the things that are coming out in the consumer world? Yes, so that's one of the overriding goals. We Every time we talk about the work that we're doing here, it, it is meant to be agnostic. So. When I look at, uh, for example, the, um, uh, the generic equipment model that we have with GEM, that is meant, doesn't refer just to semiconductor equipment. It could refer to other types of equipment. It could be um, transported with mi hopefully minimal ad uh, uh, adaption to, say, a PCB manufacturer. And so in the same way, the goal is to be able to transfer these same processes to other industries, say, say for example not just automotive but um, even uh, in uh, biomed, uh, pharma and, and other industries as well too. Is, is the goal to chop the cost down? Is it to make it more efficient throughout the supply chain? Is it to make the products uh, less likely to fail? What, what's the goal behind all this? Yeah, I think in all of the discussions I've had with the various different entities it really is focused on efficiencies uh, in, and not just efficiency but I would say effectiveness in being able to manage these much tighter uh, windows of, of um, both manufacturing as well as the overall product life cycle itself, the, the time to market cycle. So we're including design, you know, design information in this as well too. So I would have to say efficiency overrides just about everything else. We talk a lot about energy efficiency for example, we talk about materials efficiency, so managing waste, you know, how do you reduce materials waste as much as, as possible. Does this apply as well to uh, advanced packaging regardless of whether this is, uh, a lot of this has been predicated on the standard uh, planar type of development. Now we're starting to get into a much more complex supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's, a, that's a great point because, uh, well, two things really. The types of flow, the manufacturing flow, um, actually change from when we're looking at the fab into packaging and even, even more so when we get down into PCB and PCB assembly here. Um, we primarily have what we call job shop flows here uh, in the fab, whereas these tend to be more flow shop um, models. Here, so uh, kind of long, you know, uh, uh, lines from from point to point. The other thing that's happening here, as you mentioned, as we go into advanced packaging, is the, a lot of the equipment that's now moving into these has this new capability. So it it behooves the packaging community, the advanced packaging community, to take advantage of those capabilities as much as possible. So now you have the not just the protocols, but the equipment as well, to be able to take advantage of those information and control capabilities. Does this apply evenly across the supply chain? For example, analog is a completely different world than digital. You're, you're absolutely right. As we, as we look at this, there are different ways of taking advantage of the data and different ways that, that different entities fit into the, into the supply chain. 
Uh, obviously, for uh, anybody that's working on IoT device or analog, the cost structures are very, very different. And so, when you when you walk into a situation like that and you say, "Okay, I've got these great capabilities, this great software, this great you know technology," um, automatically you get some pushback in terms of, "Okay, well, how much is this going to cost me if I have to say?" Uh, rip out my whole MES system and put in new capabilities to take advantage of this, that's going to be a problem. Uh, not to mention having to, uh, um, to idle any lines to do that. So one of the things we're looking at is um, rather than having individual vendors go in um, and try to promote the cost advantages, to really take a look at a cost of ownership model. So the Smart Manufacturing Advisory Council, we're, we're currently doing a cost of ownership study that will eventually result in a, in a white paper that we hope to be able to, to give, the, um, give the industry a uh, uh, best practice you know, look at. Here's, here are, here's the cost of ownership, here's the general adoption, uh, here are some of the factors that you need to look at if you're looking at, at in, you know, putting some of these uh, capabilities in place. Tom Simon, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks so much, Ed.